Hey toy fans, I'm Tony from Analog Toys and welcome to episode four of Pallet Talk, a retro toy podcast. And I'm joined today by my first repeat guest. Uh, we're here with Michael French, host of the excellent YouTube channel Retro Blasting. Michael, how are you doing today? I am doing well. How are you, Tony? I'm good. Does that, does that sound right? First repeat guest? First repeat? It's not a prescription. That's <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> <laughs> hey, you know what? I I, I have a, an allergy med I take every day, so that didn't even sound weird to me. I was like, yeah, you know, you know, re re repeat morning meds, repeat guests. I think that sounds good. Yeah. So I, I think I mentioned at the, the end of our first pallet talk that I wasn't planning on doing these very often. And then mm -hmm. with the whole lockdown thing, I've had time on my hands and... Um, Obviously, I was chatting to, to, to Brian from Played Stallions and Video mm -hmm. Museum and had a chat with him. And uh, But being the first repeat guest, obviously, we discussed this the other day. We thought we'd go with a bit of a, a theme this time. So we are going yeah. to discuss uh, what we consider the most versatile three and three quarter scaled vehicles. But um, just before we get into that, I want to apologize. I meant to ask you on the first po um, podcast to basically tell everyone where they can find you. I do think it's a bit weird that anyone watching my channel is not aware of you, um, mm -hmm. but at least, you know, tell everyone where they can find you. Sure, yeah, no problem. Um, I run the YouTube channel Retro Blasting. We can be found on our main portal, which is youtube.com backslash Retro Blasting. There's also a retroblasting.com web portal. Does anybody use websites anymore that aren't social media? <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, we can also be found on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We have a Pinterest. We don't use it. Uh, and we're also on Patreon. Uh, for anybody who likes our content and wants to help out the channel, there is a Patreon called Retroblasting. Yeah. I um, I do use your website for listening to the Dreamland podcast. I think it's the best way for me. Nice. Um, nice. Sometimes in my job, the, the company I work for, we've got two big locations here at the port on opposite sides and actually mm -hmm. to drive between the two you've kind of got to go all the way around the port and it's a good 30 minute drive and i'll often put on the dreamland podcast and listen to the first half on the way there and then the second half on the way back so it's, <laughs> it's so funny i you know i used to commute to work every day and now i don't and commuting was when i would listen to the dreamland podcast mm. for because for anybody listening who isn't familiar uh, Melinda and Aaron on the Retro Blasting crew do that. I have no uh, direct involvement with the podcast. I don't even know what topics they pick from episode to episode. And yeah. so I used to listen to it in my commute as well. And uh, now that I don't have a commute, I find that I'm really behind. So like the last one that I posted to YouTube about Dot and the Kangaroo, I still haven't heard it. Like I, I was like, <laughs> you know, so I'm like, oh, oh, that was the last topic. Oh, what did I... Oh, it's because I didn't drive to work anymore. That's why. I <laughs> yeah, so. not many people are driving to work anymore. <laughs> no, no, not lately for sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, and no, I'll, I'll have to try and catch up on that uh, on that podcast this week, hopefully. Yeah, so. me too. Yeah. yeah. You shouldn't talk too loud. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, um, yeah, so we, yeah, we wanted to discuss what we considered to be the most versatile three and three quarter scale vehicles. And I'm going to... Uh, if, if you'll allow me, I'm going to throw out the first one. Um, yes. so growing up in the UK, I was born in 77. I did have a lot of Star Wars toys when I was a kid, um, but I think I was getting into them around the Empire type toys. So I'm not sure if this was my toy or whether if it was my brother six years older. So he was born in 71. And, um, so a couple of the toys I had that I'm sure were handed down from him was the imperial troop transport uh -huh. and that was one of my most versatile toys because later on when i got into action force international heroes or gi joe um that was actually driven by tomax and zamot the crimson twins and the troop carrier carried cobra soldiers televipers snow serpents all that kind of thing so did you have the troop transport when you were a kid I did not. My next door neighbor's older brother had it. Uh, I was born in 78 and uh, I did not get into Star Wars figures until sometime in mid to late 82. Um, the troop transport was already gone from store shelves as far as my childhood world was concerned. I didn't even know it existed. Uh, I didn't know the Death Star existed. Uh, and so one day we go over to my next door neighbor's house, because uh, we live right next door to one another. And uh, the older brother was getting ready to go to college. 
and uh, he was much older than the the kid I played with. That kid was about a, a year older than me, I think. And he decided to give his toys out of his closet to his younger brother. And when they started coming out of the closet, it was the Bespin Freeze Chamber cardboard playset. I'd never seen that before. The mm -hmm. sort of Kenner looking one, the very uh, cardstock looking thing. He brought out a snow speeder, which I'd seen but never got to buy. He brought out the Imperial Troop Transport. And he brought out a completely white plastic X-Wing fighter. I'd never seen that. And I had an X-Wing at home, and it was gray with the black engines. But it was so funny because the, the white X-Wing was shocking because I thought, what? When? How? When, when, <laughs> when was the X-Wing all white? Like, when did that happen? But then I kept looking at the troop transport, not realizing at first that it was a Star Wars toy. I thought it was just another toy that he brought down until I saw the stickers on the top that had the pictures of 3PO and R2 for yeah. the voice thing. And so that one was a real mind blow for me. It was just like, whoa, that, I don't even know what this is. Because, uh, you know, the Star Wars vehicles that weren't in the movie were generally small. Like they were, they were yeah, tiny. The mini rigs, yeah. Right, but the troop transport was a, a substantial vehicle. Like it was bigger than the land speeder. So that was my first encounter with that thing. And um, the, there were no batteries at the time when we pu pulled them out of the closet. Uh, we were just looking at them and I didn't stay very long, but I always kept it in the back of my mind. I was like that weird gray transport thing. Um, and then I eventually got one, the Imperial Cruiser, the one from the Empire line that yeah. doesn't have the voice box in it. I am talking way too long about this. So... <laughs> I, I, yeah, well, I, I think one of the reasons that toy was really versatile for me, like not only is it a great troop transporter figure, I think the fact, like I knew it was a Star Wars toy, but the mm -hmm. fact that it didn't appear in the movies, to me, kind of, it wasn't like I was trying to shoehorn a TIE fighter into my action force right. playtime, you know? So, um, yep. uh, and, and another toy that I've, I've, I don't know if, how versatile this really is, but my brother also had the land speeder, which got handed down to me. So I got the, the land speeder. I think I got a white X-Wing handed down. And then, like you, I got the, the gray one later. Um, yeah, and the, and the Imperial Troop Transport. My brother's land speeder, the top thruster was broken off. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the, the windshield was missing. And that just came a gen became a generic car. Um, yep. All my other play scenarios. When I was playing with 18 toys... I had the van and a few of the other other like the three and three quarter toys. Uh, yeah, the land speeder would just become a generic. I actually think I even pretended it was Faces Corvette at one point, which doesn't look anything like a Corvette. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. That yeah. was the real chat. That was the real challenge with a lot of um, of the GI Joe vehicles specifically. Is that when I was trying to come up with my list of just you know my mental list for versatile vehicles, I kept thinking okay, is this particular G.I. Joe vehicle contingent on a figure being able to bend their knees to use it? Because G.I. Joe vehicles really took advantage of that articulation. You know, it was like I can sit at a right angle with my knees on the floor. And, and so I kept thinking, yeah, I guess there are a few. But I've, uh, some G.I. Joe vehicles are on my list, um, uh, on, the, on the list for today. But uh, not many made it because a lot of those vehicles were G.I. Joe can use it. Lenard's the core if you really wanted to and, <laughs> and, and and like a Buck Rogers figure and that's about it you know yeah so, yeah yeah all right so what, what what's one of the the vehicles you had on your list okay the first one I wanted to bring up um I'm kind of I'm I'm kind of going chronologically back in the past but but maybe that's just coincidental I don't know maybe it'll all fall apart on my next mention uh, the Fisher Price Alpha Probe from the Adventure People line. It was the space shuttle that yep. made all the sound effects. The reason that I loved that toy so much, and I didn't own it as a kid. I got to play with it when I went over to other kids' houses. Um, but you would mix and match the figures that were laying around with it. You never really played with the Fisher Price astronauts with it. Once You probably did when it was new, but by the time I encountered it, G.I. Joe's, Star Wars, Buck Rogers, they were all laying around 
D Dukes of Hazard. I mean, they were all laying around willing to use the the, the same toy. And uh, the fact that it had the the pilot seat that slid out and then you put the character in and slid him into the cockpit and then the huge shuttle bay with the shuttle pod and everything like that. You could get a bunch of figures in there. You could get a figure in the shuttle pod and it was a spaceship. It just had so many applications and ruggedly, ruggedly built. I swear you could throw that thing off of a three-story building and it, would, <laughs> and it would be fine if it hit the grass, you know? It was just this this white plastic, just donkey of a, of a toy, like in the sense that it was just so rugged. Um, and yet at the same time, it was it was so unbreakable. Like Like, I've never seen one with broken off shuttle bay doors. I've never seen broken hinges on a Fisher Price Alpha Probe. I've seen some missing pieces, but they weren't broken off. And so yeah. uh, you got a lot of play value out of it. Because it looked like an earthbound space shuttle, you could use it with your G.I. Joes. But if you needed a spaceship, you could give it to your Star Wars, Buck Rogers, whoever. I just really loved that toy. And I, when I became an adult collector, it was one of the first things that I went after that I didn't have from when I was a kid. You know, it was, it was one of those things I was like, I have to have one of those in my collection. So, yeah, mate, you, um, you're really bringing back some memories for me. Yeah. I think like, like you, I'm, the more you talked about that, I'm very, very familiar with that toy, but I don't actually remember owning it. So I think quite like you, there must've been another kid in the street who had it. What I do remember having, um from fisher price from the, the space there was um a small like black jet looking car um, uh -huh. with a space guy in it with a big dome helmet i i did yep. have that when i was a child yeah i remember that very well that's the only adventure people thing i did have as a kid was that yeah, okay actual toy. and somehow i ended up even though it was one of the earliest toys i had before star wars before anything before Mego pocket heroes probably around the same time when I organized my toys about 13 years ago, out of all the bins, I had the astronaut, I had the spaceship, and I had the umbilical. I had all of it. It was still yeah. all there. And that was wild. I was like, whoa, one of my earliest toys is still complete. And it's in the, the display case uh, with the G.I. Joes, actually. Yeah, so, yeah. 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 Just digressing a little bit, you, you mentioned mm -hmm. before you used the turn of phrase when I became an adult collector. When? Oh, when? When was that? I, I, you know, that's that's. I wonder if that's a sliding scale for everybody. Uh, how do you define it? Do you define? And I'm asking the question to myself as well as everybody else. Is it when you you exchange your own pocket money for a secondhand toy for the first time? Because if that's the case. I became an adult collector as <laughs> well. Uh, or is it when you have your own money in your own place and you know, you're know you living your own life outside of your parents' home and you buy that first toy, secondhand or, or in store or whatever? And I keep thinking, I guess for me, adult collecting as an experience started trying to buy toys off my friends when I lived in the UK. I think that was my first taste of talking to people because this was pre-internet. So it was like, yeah. oh, you've still got a Darth Vader case full of figures? Really? Do you want them anymore? <laughs> Can I come look at them? Oh, you have a Tauntaun. I never had a Tauntaun as a kid. Would you take five quid for that Tauntaun? Excellent. I'll come over tomorrow. Like it was, that was just me. I remember this conversation I had with this kid he couldn't have been less interested in his toys at that point uh this is still when i was in the uk and he still had a lot of the weapons for a lot of the star wars figures which i had lost years ago and so he had like jedi luke still with the lightsaber and stuff and all those accessories and i was like oh and so this was 92 this was 92 when i was making these you know exchanges yeah and so i'm over at his house and i'm telling him, hey, I'll give you a quid for this and two quid for that. And his mom, and he was an American family as well. Like they were expats as well. Uh, don't want anyone to think that I was like trying to, you know, rip toys off of the, you know, the, the <laughs> cash thing. Um, and uh, so his mom comes over and she goes, 
she's like, David, are you are you sure that you, you know, want to sell those? You know, and and I'm sitting back going, because remember, this was '92. There was no hint of a Star Wars resurgence then. Yeah, like yeah. there was no. It wasn't like I was, you know, ganking these off of him for nothing with this big thing going on in the background. Yeah. And I do remember looking over at his mom and being like, no, this is just a personal hobby of mine. I was like, this is, you know, Star Wars has been dead for uh, almost 10 years now. You know, and I said, and I, I'm just, I, it's just a personal fascination with me to to collect all the different ones I didn't have. And it's just a thing. And I remember as a, like a 12 or 13 year old having to have this conversation with a grown <laughs> adult who was somehow for some reason not wanting her son and I didn't, I only bought like three or four. Like I didn't buy like everything, yeah. but that, that was, yeah, I guess I would define it as 12 to 13 years old. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it, it's very, very easy for me to define. So I probably stopped getting toys for birthdays and Christmases when I was around 12. I think when I was 13, I wanted a surfboard or something not that i've ever became much of a surfer <laughs> i don't have the balance for it right um so yeah so i i kind of got out of toys at that sort of 12 transitioning to 13 age but um i've, I've said many times before my dad's a collector he collects uh -huh. toy soldiers and stuff like that and i remember being 16 um i was leaving home within the next 12 months to to join the army you can in australia you can join the army at 17 uh and my dad would regularly go to these um, uh, model collector shows, you know, toy, toy soldier shows. And I went to one with him when I was 16 um, and he's walking around all the tables and he's picking up different toy soldiers from here and there. And we go to this one table and he knew the guy and he's chatting to him and I'm looking under the table and I see like a large, I think it was like a big milk crate type thing. Um, and in there was the action man SAS helicopter. There was a, a carded outfit i think the deep sea diver outfit uh -huh. there was a, two or three figures then there was also some boxed bionic man things in there there was a boxed um bionic woman but it's the the solid box like the denny's fisher style right. box and the maskatron i think and um anyway my dad's chatting to this guy and i'm like tugging on my dad's shirt like look there's some, there's some action man down there yeah. i'm getting all excited and my dad's like oh you um i, I think i'd mentioned to him before that i've wanted to start collecting action mm -hmm. man uh, and he spoke to this guy and and deal of the century it was like a hundred dollars for the whole box yeah and and i remember the bionic woman was it was not just boxed it was like unopened uh, right maskatron had been opened but um yeah hundred dollars for the whole box and my, my dad basically handed over the money to the guy and said to me if this starts you collecting this is you know the right the first part of it. And I went home with that box. And then, yeah, within the next 12 months, I was, I joined the army and I went through a lot of training, like six months of training. But when I came out of, when I came out of uh, training, I was in Sydney in Australia or out on the Western suburbs of Sydney, you know, army barracks called Holsworthy. Um, and in the local paper, I found an advert for an action man collector wanting to buy stuff. So I got in touch with him and then he put me, um, pointed me in the right direction of different toy shows and, and I've never stopped. From wow. That, from that day that my dad very kindly spent $100 and bought me this, what was still one of the best scores of my collecting sure. life, I suppose. So. Yeah. Yeah, my, my collecting life uh, really, uh, you know, somebody asked me the other day, that, or it was on the live stream the other day, yesterday. They said, <laughs> uh, they asked me what my biggest score had ever been collecting. And... Uh, sad to say my biggest biggest score in terms of a find that was me getting a deal on something was just a few years ago where i found the painted hair jedi luke skywalker in a dollar bin loose yeah. you know and it was like oh this this guy just thinks it's another loose jedi luke with the painted face and it's okay you know but that I've never found like something like what you're talking about. Like I've never found like this Holy grail box of stuff. It's always been me going, well, money solves all problems. So I'll just <laughs> do what I have to do. You know, like I, I've always had, had to have that mentality, you know, like yeah, if I yeah. want, if I want that Robotech SDF one play set. There's, there's no problem. Money can't fix. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, I've never, I've never had those lucky scores anymore.
Yeah, well, they they, they really don't happen these days because, you know, when when, when, my, when my dad bought this box for me, this would have been in 19, 1993 or maybe early 94. Right. And Action Man collecting was just starting to pick up, but it wasn't massive, you know, pre, pre-internet yeah. days and, and all that kind of things. It's it's become much, much harder these days to, to score things, I suppose. Sure. My big mistake was working it backwards. See, I worked it opposite where I was, I just happened to be into the one toy line from when we were kids that got valuable and popular, uh, commensurate to inflation, uh, by the mid 90s. And so I was, I was still in the middle of that without having my own money. And so it took me so long to get that. What I should have been doing in college, because college for me was when eBay began, I should have been buying all the stuff that at that time nobody wanted. Like I should have been getting my G.I. Joe Real American Hero then and my Silver Hawks and my Indiana Jones Kenner stuff. I should have been doing, which thankfully I got most of it before the door closed and, and the prices went sky high. But yeah, it was weird. It was like, why was I caught up in Star Wars that whole time when I could have been getting everything else for pennies? Ah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I remember another. School, you, you were talking as well about um, you know the first time as a as a kid when you buy something uh, secondhand. I remember it must have been like my last year in the UK, so I would have been like ten, turning eleven, and we went to what we call in England jumble sales, like uh-huh. a flea market. It was a jumble sale. I'm sure it was at my local junior school uh, in like the assembly hall at the, at the junior school, and we'd gone down to this jumble sale. Um, and I got the, the Bionic Man, the, um, the, the thermos. <laughs> oh, the, 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 yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. The transport and repair station. Transport and repair station, yeah. Um, this, this person was selling one of these at, at the jumble sale. It was mostly complete in pretty good condition, and it was 50p. <laughs> wow. This was like 1987 or something. So I'm like, yeah, even then I was... And, and and I just saw it didn't have a Bionic Man figure with it, and I don't think I had one at the time. I probably might have had my brother's old one, uh, but I took that and I used it with Action Man because it's slightly overscale but still right. slightly versatile as well. <laughs> bad, not bad. Like I went to a school jumble sale that was trying to raise money for the school when I was in high school, and somebody had an original Star Wars Han Solo laser pistol, um, but it was missing the battery cover and stuff, and that's the one that I ended up restoring, I believe. No, yeah, I think that's the one I ended up restoring in the video. Um, but like, I hold on to these things, you know, and then slowly but surely I'll find the part here and there. And thank goodness for the internet, because I don't think I would have run across a battery cover and two knobs on random, you know, boot sales or anything like that. So yeah, it's a journey, not a destination. For yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So have you got another? versatile yeah. vehicle on your list there i do so we were talking about uh just a second ago or i was i was complaining about the fact that a lot of gi joe vehicles uh, didn't uh accommodate characters that didn't have bendable knees there was one that did and i ended up using it a lot in playtime uh with a lot of different toy lines depending uh and that was the gi joe killer whale the hovercraft um the reason I loved that one so much was I would go through phases. So sometimes I'd be in a G.I. Joe phase. Sometimes I'd be in a Star Wars phase. And it just kind of swung back and forth. And the hovercraft was configured in such a way that the pilot area, you're standing. The gun turrets, you have to go straight down into them. Yeah. And the, the personnel uh, troop carrier area was all standing for the most part, like you stand them all up in there. And so that became a really great Imperial um, sort of ride as well, because I didn't have the Imperial Walker. I only had the Scout Walker. I didn't have the Star Destroyer. Um, I only had Darth Vader's TIE Fighter, and that was a one a one man fighter. Yeah. So if I had, you know, the Falcon showing up with a bunch of characters in it, Though from the good guy's side, the hovercraft would often be Darth Vader's ride of choice. And, and then I would use it with G.I. Joe. 
Uh, I would use it with some of my other three and three quarter lines. I don't think the Lone Ranger ever took a ride in it, but I, I, <laughs> thinking about that now, I feel like that's a missed opportunity and I, I should have done that. <laughs> um, but it was just, it was great because it, it was a it was a GI Joe vehicle, so it had all of the GI Joe details, all of the cool features, but it because of the way it was laid out, it didn't limit other three and three quarter action figures from jumping in. So that yeah. would be my uh, one of my picks. Yeah, it's it's interesting the way you you think about that. It's because. You said you you're choosing these vehicles and and one is it almost seems as though one of your criteria is that it had to fit the five point articulation of a Star Wars figure. Not all, not always. There's one that doesn't. There's one okay. that doesn't. It's going to be on my list. There's probably a few, but there's one that's definitely does not, and it's on my list. And you you'll laugh, but it's it's there. Yeah. Because for me, it was always about bringing Star Wars into GI Joe, if if I could, or Action Force International Heroes, as as we called it. And certainly, I remember I always wanted the Sky Striker when I was a kid. Always wanted it. Never got it. I've got one now. Um, yeah, I've always wanted the Sky Striker. So often, Lady J would pilot my white X-Wing, and it would be a nice. really poor substitute for the Sky Striker. Hey, it though, wasn't hey, quite the same, but... No, no but it, now that you know there was a white Sky Striker, if you'd had that... Uh, X-Wing, that would have been a little closer. Like you could have, yeah. you might have even stripped the stickers off and painted the the striping on the <laughs> the wings and stuff. Uh, that that but I I uh, I agree with you that there there were certain toys that um, like that where a GI Joe worked really well um, getting in there. Like uh, one of the ones oddly that I used as a kid. It's not on my list, but I'm just thinking about it right now. Uh, that I use with GI Joes a lot was the Cap Two Mini Rig, the one with the suction yep. cup arms and the pincher arms, and it's got the thing. I used to drop Cobra soldiers and stuff in there and have them land, you know, this thing like a Destro construct, you know. And GI Joe be like, "What's that?" And then, be like, <laughs> you know, was, ah! that was like a great toy for that that purpose. That is almost a little bit similar to the what's it the ballistic. Pogo. Oh, Pogo Battle Ball. Yeah. yeah, except the difference the difference for me was is that while the Pogo Battle Ball definitely jumped around, like because it's the Pogo ball, like it boing boing, it even has springs on the thing. The cap two was like it had a jet engine on the bottom because of the sticker, like a a, th a jet thruster. So it didn't look like it necessarily jumped. It looked like it could hover and then use its arms for different things. Definitely goofy. <laughs> but not as but not as goofy as the pogo. It looked more destro as as compared to Doctor Mindbender, if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna be quiet. I'm just gonna be quiet. <laughs> it's a podcast. You can't be quiet. <laughs> I know, I know. But it's like it's like I'm revealing my super weirdness. And I don't know, I don't know if I don't know if the audience is turning on me at this point. So, uh, uh, well, my my next. Mm -hmm. but, and this is probably my, I haven't done these in any sort of order, but probably yeah. my number one most versatile vehicle would have been Galoob's 18 van. Oh, huh? yep. I have it. Yeah. So, so I, so I, I had a quite a bit of the three and three quarter A team stuff. Um, but certainly the, the van that very quickly became part of, of GI Joe. And when they would do like undercover missions, Yep. Um, you know, and yeah, um, just uh, that's a, it's a really cool design for a toy, actually. It's a shame it's quite fragile, um, but it is a really, really good design, like with the, the removable roof, so you can set everyone up inside. Uh, they do tend to fall off the chairs if you're driving around a little bit, <laughs> maybe because okay. you some seat belts, but <laughs> <laughs> no, the uh, the 18 van, I wish that I'd known about that when I was a kid. Because I wasn't even aware, maybe in a in a Christmas catalog, I might have seen them once, but I wasn't aware of the three and three quarter inch uh, A team figures. I had the big ones, like we talked about on the last yeah um, last Pallet talk, and they didn't have a van, at least not an official one. Yeah. You had to practically carve out a metal one and and ditch the half body B A Baracus and gut it 
and then put them <laughs> all inside this jagged metal construct uh, if you wanted one. But when I saw in a, it, as an adult collector, when I discovered the three three quarter inch line and I saw the van, I was like, I've got to get one of those one day. And I finally ended up with one not too long ago, like maybe three years ago or, or a little more than that. Um, and I got it intact, no box, but it, the, nothing on it was broken. You know, everything was because it's got a lot of fragile trim work and everything like that. Yeah. Um, I love the fact that the roof pops off. I love the fact that you can get a number of figures in there with seating. I hate it when there's no seating. It's like, <laughs> hey, look, it's a big empty space like the, the turtle van. It's just like, hey, look, it's bench oh. seats for an indeterminate number of figures. Good luck. Um, I, I think that's a solid piece. And you could you could pull that, that van up right alongside a number of G.I. Joe vehicles. And if you were just glancing over, it would blend right in. I mean, it really yeah. would. It's a great piece. Yeah, that's a good choice. Yeah. And, and, and so I, I had a number of the toys. I didn't have... Faces Corvette. I didn't have, uh, I think Murdoch had a jet bomber thing. Right. Um, but another toy that they released was the A-Team attack tank that had a trailer. Oh. Um, that That's another. I probably, when I was a kid, played with that more than I did the van. Um, uh -huh. That was just a cool, it was, it, and being black, like it sat perfectly next to the Cobra Stinger. Um, right. I like the fact that in the trailer, um there was some sort of like tripod mounted missile launcher that you had to assemble and it had various mm -hmm. missiles and i've always wanted to do a video on that toy but the the one i've got is mint in the box and i'm not going to take it out of the yeah, box yeah don't make... don't no. don't no, I mean, it, I'll, I'll start looking out for just a loose one for you so you can demo it you know like yeah. maybe it's got a maybe there's like a peeling sticker or something on it i'll find one yeah so yeah i'll send it to you but uh yeah i i when I found out about that line and I saw how expansive it was on the internet, I was like, how did I miss this as a kid? I must have been blind when I went into a toy store to everything but what I was looking for. Like, I must have just been like, this is all static. This is all static. Hey, that's He-Man. My, my brother collects that. Ah, Star Wars. Ah, mask. Like, I must have just zoned out everything else because the line was so big, and yet I didn't see 80% of it. Weird. It was, it was really, really popular in the UK, and I think one of the reasons for that is when... So Palatoy pretty much shut up shop in 84. They was still had product in toy shops in 85, but they weren't developing anything new. But then at the end of 1985, basically Palatoy was completely gone. And Action Force International Heroes, Hasbro, the rebrand, came out in 87. In 1986, we had no Action Force on the shelves in the UK. And that is around the time that Galoob's A-Team was popular. So nice. I think 1986, that's what every kid wanted because Star Wars yeah. had gone by then. Can you hear that? Only slightly. <laughs> I, I, live, I live near a primary school and that's just... Uh -huh. a, I don't know why they've still got the bell going because the school's closed and it still goes off at, you know... It must, start... be, automa it must be automated. It must be automated. Yeah, just yeah. schedule. Well, they, they, they switch it off during the school holidays, but yeah, like no kids are going to school at the moment and the, and no. the siren still goes off for recess and all this. So. That's funny. <laughs> at, least it's, at least it's not like the tornado siren or anything like that. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. So uh, you, I'm sorry, you were saying before the siren went off that you were uh, talking about 86, 87 as the years of yeah, Galoot's yeah. 18. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, and I, I think that's one of the reasons it was it was definitely popular in the UK because it just Galoop, I think, just lucked out in, in the UK. It came out at a time when Palatoy Action Force had ended and Hasbro International Heroes Action Force was yet to start. So Right, right. Yeah. That's a good bridge though. That's a lucky bridge because that yeah. way you had some kind of continuity. And when you got to the other side and they brought out new action force uh figures, you 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 had all those other vehicles that were mostly compatible with them. That's yeah. great. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, certainly, yeah. My, my A-Team attack tank became a, a, a Cobra tank. Um, oh, for sure. For yeah. sure. So who's, who, do you remember the bad guys in that A-Team line? They were so <laughs> generic. It was like Eye Patch Man and sort of Native American looking dude. And, you know, it was, it was like, what is this? Like, this is so weird. 
Yeah, because with, with the eighteen line as well, they they didn't sell the figures individually. They came in a in a in a four pack. Yeah, you could also get an eighteen headquarters or training center, which was a really basic toy. It was a slab of cardboard that you placed on the on the ground, and then it had like sandbag bunkers, really cheaply blow molded stuff, and you yeah. could get the set of figures. I think that's how I got the figures first. Um, but then with every vehicle, it would come with a figure as well. So I ended right. up with like, I think I ended up with like three BA Baracus because I had the, it, one came with the van, one came with the tank, and then one came with the mm-hmm. headquarters set. Right. Uh, but yeah, but with the with the bad guys, I, I remember getting the set of four bad guys who are five point articulation. You look back at it now, then the names of the characters, I don't remember all four of them, but it was Cobra, Python, Rattler, and someone else. Like, there's no way they weren't copying G.I. Joe. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, and, but at the same time, like, they were so uh, not of the show. Like, they were just, yeah. <laughs> well, let's make some bad guys that are kind of like people they might encounter on the show. Maybe on a Thursday. Like, <laughs> you know, like, it wasn't anybody specific. And, and I guess... That speaks to the nature of the show. You know, the show did have different challenges every week. So until they started really uh, honing in on the whole escaping from the army thing, you know, the military trying to get them back. Um, yeah, I guess it does make sense, but it 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 kind of made it one sided. It like I remember when I had the the bigger figures, which I still do, but when I played with them, I always. I, I had no interest in the bad guys from that line. It was more of a, well, I guess I'll see what happens when B.A. Baracus gets in a fist fight with Beast Man. Like, I, I <laughs> you know, that'll just be what I do because uh, the bad guys did not entice me to collect them uh, on that on that level. It was weird. Yeah, yeah, no, that's probably the same for me with um, with Ram- the Rambo toy. I remember seeing that for the first time in toy stores, and I was a big fan of the, the movies, and uh, yeah, it just blew my mind the first time I saw it. But I got really confused because they never aired the cartoon in, in the UK. Uh, at the top, British censorship was a lot stricter. It was far too right. too violent. Um, so seeing that, I was just like, well, I know Rambo and I know Troutman, and I always thought that Cat was the, the character from Rambo First Blood Part Two, the, right. the agent that he meets up with. Mm-hmm. Um, and then obviously Ser- Sergeant Havoc does look like the guy he fights in the helicopter at the end of Part Two. Yes. But then like, like you've got ninjas, you've got motorcycle gang members, and uh-huh. yeah, it was confusing. But I still, I still, I went with it anyway. I went with it. <laughs> And and also, you know, those lines, at least I I never got into sectars as a kid because I just couldn't, I didn't have the, you know, you have to pick, you have to pick your asks, you know, it's like, I'm only going to get so many toys a year, but it was nice that Coleco made those two lines the same. So I guess if Rambo wanted to fight Spydrax or something, he could, which is pretty neat in theory. I should, I should put them together and see what happens. (laughs) I, that, that was, that was a toy line that, Never came across my radar when I was a kid. Um, yeah. Never. I, I didn't even think I knew anything about sectars until later on in, in adult life. And started yeah. Researching I, I saw a bunch of the commercials. The commercials were like you just constant in the United States during that time period for sectars. They really tried hard. And I remember seeing them in stores, but I never knew anybody that had them. I mean, yeah, didn't know anybody. So, yeah. Actually, when when I was researching my my video on on the Rambo toy line, and I'd go back through, and I, I started looking for the toy commercials. Mm-hmm. Man, Coleco put a lot of effort into their yeah. their marketing and advertising, and they really um, did. And I, and I again never saw those commercials on TV in the UK either. I, I don't think I don't think British uh, the censorship board or whatever would would even allow the the commercials on TV. Right. I don't know that for certain, but it wouldn't surprise me in the UK at that time. I mean, they they changed Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles to Hero Turtles because they thought yeah. call it a ninja and it's going to turn kids into psychopaths, which is just <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't I remember, understand that train of thought. <laughs> I was there at the heyday of that. I mean, we literally went over in ninety at the height of Ninja Turtle popularity. And I mean, my brother was totally into the Ninja Turtles. He had just gone to see the theatrical film uh, in theaters. And we walk 
you know, off the plane at Gatwick, we, we start getting our lives together. And I go down with my dad to the Weybridge. Um, I don't remember if it was a Safeway or a Sainsbury's, uh, like the next morning to just go pick up, you know, first round of food for the new house. And, uh, I remember looking over at the magazine section and there was Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles. And I was going, wait, what? Like, I was like, am I in a bizarro universe? Like, what? <laughs> and we quickly figured out, we heard, we asked around and figured out why that was. And pretty interesting. No nunchucks, no, none of that. Yeah. You know, yeah, pretty cool. So, um, all right, have you got another vehicle on your list there? Awkward pause. Uh, yeah, yeah, I do. I do have a, a a number of vehicles on my list. So this this vehicle, this is the one that's going to probably be the most esoteric off my list. However, uh, I realized I couldn't not put it on the list because of its versatility, and I I feel like I should be given a mulligan for this one because I've made an entire video about it. So anybody who doesn't know what I'm talking about can go see a very solid reference for this, this vehicle. It was produced by, <laughs> all right, yeah, it's produced by a company called Arco and it was called the MCB one MCB dash one Bigfoot, not related to the monster truck that was popular in the eighties in the United States. Uh, it was its own thing. It was a generic toy that was designed specifically to accommodate any three and three quarter inch action figure that you had. And there were a lot of these kind of toys that were being sold, uh, in, at least in the United States at the time. I don't know if it was the same in the UK, but you could go to Radio Shack, for example, and get generic battery powered toys that were sci-fi and military that were just there to accommodate one or two G.I. Joe's or Star Wars figures or whatever, just whatever you wanted to put in there. And the Arco was cool because even though it was motorized, which I'm not huge on motorizing things because they have a gear system. And once they run out of batteries, a kid can't push it along without stripping it. Um, but that being said, this was a very robust little toy at the time. And it had this. It, it sort of bridged the uncanny valley of design between space rover and military tactical vehicle. Like it just kind of straddled that gap, you know? And uh, it had the, the, the big cool turret on the back that a, a character could sit in. So like, imagine all you listeners out there, imagine the GI Joe vamp or the SAS Panther, depending on your, your preference. Um, with that turret on the back, that dual cannon. But now imagine that dual cannon has a seat that one figure can fit in. And then yeah. you have the two seats in the front. And then it's motorized with like eight wheels or something crazy. So it just, or 12 wheels. So it just can go and go and go. And it goes forward and reverse. I used that toy constantly for everything. And uh, at, at first, as an adult, I thought that it might have been one of those orphaned, um, local finds. I didn't know if it was something that anybody knew about. And then I, I was um, with Melinda a few years ago uh, and we ran across some Christmas catalogs, uh, old Christmas catalogs at a uh, uh, antique store. We bought them and brought them, bought them, uh, brought them home. And I was thumbing through and it was like the Christmas catalog of 84, 85, something like that. And I'm flipping through it, and suddenly there it is, the Arco MCB-1 for sale in the Christmas catalog that year of a major retailer. And I thought, oh, okay, well, this isn't this isn't a chump toy. This was in the Christmas catalog, you know, one page over from G.I. Joe and Star Wars. So, um, yeah, that's one of the ones that's on my list. I loved I, – I would really love to – and I'm going to shut up in a minute, I promise. I would <laughs> really love to eventually one day do – uh, a video or research into the generic three and three quarter inch motorized vehicles of the eighties. Like just the ones that toy companies that couldn't afford an IP license, you know, they're like, we're going to get in on this somehow. We're going to do something like uh, there was the one company here in the States. What was their name? They made the ones that had no batteries in them at all. They were practically blow molded 
and they were sold in the same aisle as the sand, the sand buckets and sand shovels for yeah. building sand castles. It was like the same area, but you could buy like a jet fighter and it had like an opening canopy, no details inside, like just a molded seat. And you could kind of get a GI Joe in there, but you could buy it for like $2 or something or less. It was like a dollar and you had a jet fighter. Um, I need to do that. Yeah. Yeah, that would be interesting. I know uh, we, we certainly had a lot of that type of product in, in the UK. I don't, uh, none of the toys in particular stand out as something that, that, that I have, but I do remember remember seeing that. You know, we, I'm sure the States is the same. We would have, we were able to get toys in department stores, but then like your local toy shop always had the, the best and the biggest range. Um, but then, you could go to cheaper shops and they would have different types of products and that in there. So yeah, very, um, there's, there's a lot of interesting stuff that comes out in, in different countries. I think, um, uh, well, when I was talking to, to Brian, um, from the Mego museum, he, he was sort of talking about a lot of the stuff that, that Palatoy brought out in the UK and how they, I, I, I agree with him, but I'll use his words. They improved all these American products Nice. Uh, yeah. I yeah. no, look, I totally <clears throat> excuse me. I total I'm a little biased in that in that regard in the sense that I believe it. I really do. I mean, when I saw the SAS Panther, I was like, yeah. "Oh my god, that thing's amazing. Rubber tires? Give it to me." <laughs> like, you know, black black with yellow Tron like accents. Yeah, I uh, I, I love the uh, Palatoy X-Wing. It's one of my holy grails. I want I want a Palatoy, and I know it comes in many versions, but something with the chromed R2-D2 and the, you know, the uh, just the way it, it looked with no electronics, I thought it was sharp. I thought it was really cool. So, I yeah, I totally buy that. The Palatoy Death Star, hello. It's so yeah. much better than the Kenner one. I'm just saying. Eh. <laughs> just I'm just going to sidetracked for a moment here so I, I dropped a video yesterday on um my my review of snake mountain i watched it that was good thanks and no, um you know that you care about my opinion on it but i'm just saying that was a good video oh thank no thank you i do care your opinion does mean a lot to me <laughs> um but interesting i've had a number of comments in the comment section uh, I, I was expecting to get a bit of hate because i'm kind of saying that it's uh, not all that great but most people agree with me, but I was actually surprised the amount of people who've come out and said, do a video on the Fright Zone. That's like, seems like every fifth comment in that video, it was only dropped yesterday, do a video on the Fright Zone. I don't own the Fright Zone. I never had, never had the Fright Zone as a kid, but you have one, don't you? I you... just got one. Because yeah. after I did my Snake Mountain review, people told me, do the Fright Zone next. Actually, what they told me was, have Skeletor do the Fright Zone next. Yeah. Um specifically but yeah they uh they wanted the fright zone and as as uneventful as that play set is visually i haven't even gotten it out of the box yet um but from pictures i've seen it doesn't have as much going on structurally as gray skull and snake mountain like it's it's a it's more like a corner with like a yeah. tree and um but people are nuts for it. They want to talk about the Fright Zone. They want, you know, a video about it. And I found one through uh, Matt Swafford at Reclaimers. He found one that the puppet hasn't been ripped up. It's mint, the the, the monster so that, puppet. That's mm -hmm. something I wanted to ask you was, was actually mm -hmm. about that puppet. So that's made of like the same rubber material as like the Action Man Frogman suits, which just... Yeah. Um, perish over time. Yeah, as a matter of fact, let me show it to you on camera. Let me grab it real quick. You okay. uh, tell a dirty limerick or something like that. <laughs> Everybody drink. <laughs> I'll just uh, edit this bit out of the video. <laughs> All right. So I have here uh the bag that they were protecting this puppet in with uh the horde fright zone uh instructions for assembly and oh that's very nice here's our address we're always here to help <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, <laughs> Mattel toys. Yeah. Uh, okay, so here is the minty but fragile. Oh, yeah. It's like a... It's like a, a rubber kind of thin, just... And the funny part was, and this is where it got embarrassing. So Matt, you know, he's this ruggedly, you know, handsome man's man kind of guy. <laughs> like you. He's a lot like you in that way. And, uh, you know, he's got, what are those things called? Uh, arms. He's got arms. And uh, he, um, you know, he was like, yeah, you know, when I saw it, I was just tempted, you know, to try and, you know, see if the puppet would fit my hand or whatever. But it wasn't even close. You know, this thing was made for kids. And I was like. Yeah, I was blessed with squirrel paws and, um, <laughs> tiny, you know, as, as people who are kind to me go, they're like, you have hands for fine work. And I'm like, yeah, thanks, whatever. But uh, the, the embarrassing thing is, is that I can get my hand all the way in the puppet with no problem. So, yeah, I shouldn't have shown that on camera. Uh, anyway. <laughs> that looks so inappropriate in the oh, it, it, totally, <laughs> it totally is. Like, it's, it's not, this is not something, this, it, it's, this is awful. I mean, but this one is minty mint. Like, it's been perfectly uh, preserved. I mean, it's, yeah. Um, I'm going to make sure that it stays that way somehow, some way. I don't know how, uh, but I shall. So... That is the puppet from Fright Zone. So yeah, I'm going to be doing a Fright Zone uh, review here in the next few weeks. I hope. Um, well, well, I'm sorry. Skeletor will be doing a Fright yeah, Zone <laughs> review. Uh, but how are how are how are? Let me rephrase. I'm, I'm having problems with my words because I'm getting old. How frequent do you see a Fright Zone in Australia uh, in toy shows or for sale? I don't. Okay. Um, okay. Certainly not with the, the you know, you, you might you might find the basic shell there with the tree missing and stuff like that. Right. But to me, the Fright Zone is not a play set. It's a diorama. Yes. It's yes. something you put on a bookshelf, even when you were a kid, and displayed your figures on. Right. There's not a lot of interactivity going on there. Yeah. It's, yeah. Should, they should have sold it like that. Fright Zone, the diorama. <laughs> oh, that would have been great. Hey, speaking of which, um, there was a lot of confusion when I did my Snake Mountain uh, review, and I didn't know if you'd seen this in your comments. Have you gotten any comments saying you're missing the puppet? No. Okay, I got a ton of comments on my Snake Mountain review at the time saying, you don't have the puppet, you're missing the puppet, because they were confusing the Fright Zone and the Sectar's Hive with the hole in Snake Mountain, thinking that that was something where a puppet was supposed to come out. And I'm like, no, you're thinking of the Sectar's Hive and the Fright Zone. No, I don't think so. See, when I was seven, I was at this kid's house, and I saw it. And it, I also saw the big scenes in Star Wars. It's like, uh, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. I just wanted to ask. Yeah. No, I mean, I've, I've, I have had one guy comment saying that he... He clearly remembers watching one episode of the cartoon where right. it actually showed Snake Mountain looking like the playset. I'm like, yeah, no. So uh, some people have, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, when they false, they false memory. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a false a false memory. Like, um, and but by all means, like I, I'm I'm. I'm I'm not perfect. I do make mistakes in videos. I may say things wrong. I I often, if I'm not sure about something, I'll try and be a little bit vague so people can't, right. you know, uh, have a little nitpick and then you got you got this wrong. But it's when when people will jump in the comments and and tell you that you've made a mistake, but they mm -hmm. clearly haven't researched it. They're just basing it off a childhood memory or something like that. Right. You know. I certainly, I, I did a video just before Christmas, a Christmas special video where I talked about my uh, Christmas memories. And uh -huh. in that, I, I talked a lot about getting the Cobra Hydrofoil in 1986. It turns out that the Hydrofoil was not released until 1987. But I didn't really research that video. I just, um, yeah. I just basically put together a list of, as best I could remember, what my favorite toys were from each Christmas. And went through it, um, and and no one no one really sort of nitpicked and like 
came out with a statement like, oh, you're wrong or, or whatever. It was right. like, oh, hey, man, if you look on the Blood for the Baron website, you'll see that the actual Hydrofor didn't come out till 87. And um, But, yes, it's, it's, it, is, it is funny how you get those. Like a lot of people who seem to think that they had Ghostbusters toys in 80s. Yes, 84. Yeah, yeah, which there were never movie toys. None. <laughs> None. I had a guy uh, one time, he he commented that uh, my Bespin Luke figure from childhood had to be a bootleg because it did not have a country of origin stamp on it. And I said, I bought this at the mall, the local mall toy store. I remember the evening in 1984. It was the one I'd been looking for. I brought him home. I've had him my whole life. He came on a Return of the Jedi card back. I know it's legitimate Kenner product. No, there are no... And other people were jumping in going, uh, dude, this is all very well researched. There are Star Wars Kenner figures that don't have country of origin stamps on them. Yeah. Like, there are, you know, a lot of them. And uh, it's amazing what people think they know. I just had one today uh, over the R2-D2 restoration. Uh, there was a guy saying that... Uh, he was uh, certain that the reason that the R2 uh, wasn't standing correctly was because I had screwed up the screw placement in the in the leg. And I said, um, I told the guy, I said, there was a divot in the leg where the piece had broken off. And, the, and, the, and William still had the piece. He had sent me the piece and the piece fit into this little divot. So I knew exactly where to tap the hole to put the new... Uh, screw in yeah and i said did you happen to notice sir that the two legs were actually different thicknesses at the foot like there's one leg that where the the, the foot pad is real thin and the other leg is visibly a thicker plastic mold and i said now that is you know also um he was saying that the shoulders weren't even uh when i put them back together and I'm like, have you ever looked at multiple R2-D2s from Kenner or Palatoy? Not one of them are the same. There isn't yeah. a one of them that's the same. And I, 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 I might put it on Patreon tomorrow, but I lined up all of my vintage R2-D2s that I have in my collection. And I just pan across them. And none of their stickers are on the same way. Yeah. There's no uniformity. You, I even pan down on the legs. And you go across and it's like the shoulders are always either near perfect or variants on either side and i got to this one r2d2 he had two different sorry two different <laughs> legs he had he had a leg with a real thin foot pad and a leg with a real thick foot pad and when you looked at his shoulders one was slightly higher than the other and it's like the moment you say that there is meaning the general you the moment you say there is a right way or a wrong way that this was done, you immediately don't know anything about vintage '80s toy manufacturing. It was not, it was not like making uh, a, a, a space shuttle engine. There, that kind of precision was not in the process. So I don't know where some people. What was it? Uh, what Neil deGrasse Tyson said something about the most dangerous thing is a person who knows just enough to think to think they know what they're talking about, but not enough to, to realize they might be wrong or something like that. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. 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 I, I, I've got, um, I've got a Obi-Wan Kenobi figure in my, I mean, I've got one here in the cabinet behind me, but I've got one in the spares bin that I know a lot of, uh, Star Wars figures suffered from legs being slightly different lengths. Right. I've hung on to this one for so long because it is, really really pro like you cannot get this guy to stand actually if you put like a plastic figure stand into the short leg and, uh -huh. then tur and turned it around so that the long leg didn't stand on it he may be able to stand upright because it's a good like two to three millimeters difference but lean <laughs> nice. it's, it's like it's, it's it's my drunk ben kenobi he's always like this <laughs> i found i found a lot of uh, original luke skywalkers that are like that my childhood original luke skywalker has one foot that's like that he always stands at a lean he's always the farm boy luke yeah farm boy luke yeah he's always been that way and yeah, i found I, others like that i it, think it's more prevalent with the um 
the, the the first release figures. I think Kenner obviously improved when I haven't seen it as much in Empire and Jedi type figures. Um, right. But yeah, it's uh, yeah, the stormtrooper. <laughs> stormtroopers sometimes they lean because they're first release. Darth Vader's tiny legs are stuck together. You know, he's yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, and, and sort of going along with the same track as well. I've, I, I, I'm trying to think of a good example, but to generalize in some of the videos, certainly the ones I do around Palatoy, where I've spoken to Bob Breakin and Roger Morrison and Brian Turner and these guys to get the best information. I will always state in the video, you know, these, this has come from this source or, or whatever. And I will still get people in, in the comments going, no, 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 that's, that's not how they made action man back then for this reason. And that reason I'm like, okay, so you, so you have a working theory, but I've just got this information from the original designer. So right. I, I'm, I'm just going to go with what Bob tells me. And, and, and Bob will always be up front. Like he doesn't remember everything. He, he often says that um, he, he, he'll do like panels occasionally. He does a few Star Wars shows in the UK where he does a, a bit of a talk about the history of Palatoy and stuff. And he always opens with and, and says to the collectors, look, you need to remember, guys, I'm happy to answer whatever questions I can, but you guys know more about Star Wars or Action Man than I do. He said, right. because this was just my day job, and it was yeah. uh, 40 years ago, and, and people are often ask him around some of the decisions that were made. Like, Bob was the designer of the toys. Marketing was a whole different thing. So right. decisions as to why they chose to go with that toy and not with that toy, he often doesn't remember that kind of thing, so... I wonder if those people could be tracked down. Now, that would be interesting. Find uh, out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've, I, I know. So I know J Jeff Maisie, he was the Action Man brand manager from around 70 to 76, which is like the mm -hmm. best period of Action Man, really. Right. That's when, they, that's when they were doing all the ceremonials and they brought mm -hmm. out the green hands and all that stuff. But he then moved on to become manager for Star Wars for like all of Europe, um, which... He he says in interviews that that was he, he found that much more enjoyable being a marketing guy. Like he mm -hmm. he did miss the fact that you know he couldn't sort of see much stuff develop because they were just bringing kind of product over. Um, right. But just just the whole way that it was marketed and distributed across Europe. So interesting guy to talk to. That's cool. That's really mm. cool. Well, look, Michael, we've been going for about an hour, and as you know, mm -hmm. I like to play this game called Okay. Sum it up in one. But being my first repeat guest, I wanted to flip the script, and, uh -oh. you, can ask, and you can ask me. Um, okay. And I hope you're not prepared because I'll be honest, I have not been prepared the other times. I've, <laughs> <laughs> I've just uh, what I normally do. I, the first one I did with you, I was kind of looking at what you had on the shelves in the background, uh -huh. and trying to remember certainly toy lines that I know you've either got or made videos sure. about. So is, yeah. if we did it this time, I would just be asking you about Kylie because that's all that's in the background. <laughs> dang, dang it. Oh, Ooh. I would have been so ready for that. All right, all can right. Can sum up Kylie in one word? Oh, gosh, can I sum up Kylie in one word? Okay, that's right, because this game is all about one word. <sighs> immortal. Oh. Kylie is immortal. That's That's how I sum it up. If there's, it, you know, I was telling Melinda this in a conversation we had months ago um, about interests in general. This isn't about Kylie specifically, but it's about interests in general. So I hope everybody can relate to this. It's, it's one thing to be interested in something because it tickles your brain, right? And you're, and it's something that just you're, you're attracted to on a uh, intellectual level or a tactile level or you know whatever. But there are only a few things in everybody's lives that fascinate them or uh, excite them or get them enthused that stay with them throughout their whole lives. And that's not, that, that's not in other words, that's not under your control. Like it, what I mean by that is, what I mean by that is Star Wars was a huge interest of mine as a kid, right? And then... Star Wars ended for everybody else because there were no movies. After 1983, nothing, right? 
Jedi's it, and then it's just me still loving the three films and trying to buy toys off of kids in middle school, right? And then, all of a sudden, after everybody in high school tells me that I'm the Star Wars guy, they were nice about it. They were never, they never picked on me. Uh, but they just thought it was quirky. It was kind of weird. It would be like if you knew a kid in high school who just loved Dr. Zhivago. That's what it was like at the time. It was like, oh, yeah. He's that guy that loves Dr. Zhivago. It's just this weird character quirk. He just loves it. Then it comes back as the special edition, becomes the number one movie in America again, right? And you want to look at somebody and go, that didn't happen to Dr. Zhivago, did it? Happened to the movie that I was into because I've got taste. And then it just rolls on. And for better or worse, Star Wars is still around. It's still kicking. For better or worse, whatever it's doing, that interest, despite chance despite destiny and nothing that i affected in any way it's still there and it's still going my preference is still going right okay kylie that's why i said she's immortal because that's the other interest in my life that's just still going like she's like the energizer bunny she's just still making records she's still making music she still looks like she's you know 30 years old she's still just you know and you just sit back and you're just like <laughs> I like that too. And it's still going. And look at that. You know, where's your favorite band from the nineties jerk? Oh yeah. No one's heard of them anymore. Color me bad. <laughs> They're gone. <laughs> you know? And so I just sit back, you know, loving that, you know, it's, I don't know. I know it sounds petty, but that, yeah. So immortal, but I have to ask you questions. So, okay. Yeah. So I, do I ask, do I ask you five? Is that right? Yes. Five. Yeah. What one five. at a time. <laughs> one at a time, but I have to ask you five. Okay. And it has to be one word answers. Okay. Um, question number one. The toy line you were most excited about that disappointed you the most upon inception as a child. Like you were really pumped for it. You thought it was going to be great. And then wow, wow. A team. Wow. The six okay. inch. The six yeah. inch. Oh, the six inch. Right. The rictus. Yeah. 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 Got yeah. Okay. Okay. A team. Oh, you want the next question? I thought you were going to expound on that. All right. All right. <laughs> uh, I, I, I can. I can okay. because because I, I had both the six inch and the three and three quarter when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. I was more excited about the six. I, I, I got that, I think, before Rambo, but because of the similar scale, I wanted to, them to interact. And just the whole fact that they they made a lot of product for the six inch and they didn't give us a van. It was like, what was the whole point of it? It was the, they should have kept a, Amy Allen and given us the van. Like the van was the fifth character to me, not, not Amy Allen, the All ugliest right. action figure in the world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, poor, poor Melinda Coulet. I mean, yeah, she didn't yeah. deserve that. She didn't deserve it. And then she got kicked off the show for reasons that George Papard is just George Papard. Um, but I digress. All right. All right. So next, next question. Um, sum up in one word your thoughts on the soccer player action man figures the football player i said soccer my god edit that out i don't want to i don't want to be that i don't want to be that american all right <laughs> let me rephrase the question sum up in one word your thoughts on the footballer action men I'm trying to do it in one word. I need two words. Okay, okay. Yeah, no, no. I've got a word for you. Hey. Nobbly. Because <laughs> of the shorts? <laughs> Nobbly knees. <laughs> right, right. Okay. okay. Nobbly. <laughs> oh, what is Bob going to say when he sees this? <laughs> All right. Hey, you could have said anything. You could have said exquisite. You could have said whatever you wanted. No, you do not uh, ask me about the whole toy line. You were asking me about the footballers. and Oh, the, yeah, the, of course I was. Those I knees <laughs> shouldn't be, those knees should be covered. <laughs> we're going to go play some football. Yeah. Uh, 
They look like old prospectors, but with young heads. Uh, all right. Next question. Uh, okay. <sighs> Got to make this a good one. We're, 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 two for, we're two for five. So, okay. All right, here we go. Um, tell me in one word Star Wars' place in toy history. Revolutionary. Okay. All right. Revolutionary. All right. All right. Next up. Can I get out of that quickly? Yes, yes, you can. Of course, it's your podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, but this is your, it's my podcast, but your game at the moment. (laughs) Uh, um, And when when I say revolution, there, there were a lot of, there have been a lot of revolutionary toy lines and certainly Star Wars was not the first three and three quarter scale um, toy line to come out, but it was the first one to do it right. And okay. yeah, it really did. Like you go back to the seventies figures were much larger, uh, even Migos, you know, Migos six, seven inch, whatever action man, GI Joe, the Bionic man, the Lone Ranger, they, they were all, they were all bigger. Um, and it's just an, an untapped market of giving kids affordable vehicles to play with. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously, I have the op- you know the benefit of having this gloriously abundant world that George Lucas had created. So yeah, so revolutionary. It, it really did change the play patterns of young children. All right. Biggest missed opportunity for a toy line that did exist not one that didn't one that did but missed that could have been amazing well i can't talk about the six inch 18 van again because i've already used that okay Um, do you i mean honestly do you really think that the the a team show um could have supported an even bigger or more different uh, toy line than what it had? As we digress for a moment, I'm just genuinely curious. That's not a challenge, by the way. No, probably not. It's it's more to do just with the fact that I, I, I was happy with the three and three quarter inch van, but I wanted mm-hmm. the big van as well. So yeah, right. but la- later on as a kid, I, when I started getting Rambo figures, I would mix them together because they were such similar scale, extra characters. Um, and a, a van, a van would have been good for that. But the biggest, right. the biggest missed opportunity. <laughs> um, oh wow! Tarkin. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, because I wanted that figure when I was a kid. You know, the the first sure. movie I watched was it was Star Wars. Um, uh-huh. Did you, did you watch Empire first? No, I saw Star Wars first, okay, and then yeah, and yeah. then I couldn't see Empire because it wasn't on home video. So I had to go to the theater and see Jedi. Yeah, and then I saw Empire. So so I I, I was when I was getting Star Wars toys when I was a kid. It was probably similar to you, like 81, 82, and I was getting Empire stuff. But the thought, the luxury of having an older brother, I had some stuff hand, handed down from him. Yeah. Most of the original 12 figures, and I could never understand why Tarkin had this big black button on his head. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. I was, the death squad commander was, I, was yeah. like, I couldn't understand why they, and I'm thinking, where was the bit in the movie where he wore that big black dome helmet? <laughs> You're right, right, because all those guys actually wore black uniforms, so it was very yeah. throwing. Now, do you have the retro collection, Tarkin? Yes, I do. Oh, uh, okay, you do. Okay, because I was going to say, I've got a spare. If you don't have that one, I'm going to send it to you. No, uh, I, was, that... I, w- I was very lucky. Someone, <clears throat> uh, a fan of the channel, um, g- gifted it to me. He, he had a spare. And weirdly, I was down in Perth in January, and we have a chain of stores in all of the big shopping malls called um, called Zing. It's uh, mm-hmm. just pop culture collectibles. There's lots of statues, lots of like half the shop I can't even look at because it's like Funko Pops and right. Stuff. But but then they you know so they do a lot of you know like the Marvel Legends and all that. And 
Um, when I was down there in, in January for a small holiday to see the family, I had like three of these Zing stores nearby. So I went to, I visited all three of them because they've got slightly different product. Every right. single one of these stores had the Death Star board game with Tarkin in it for like like clearance, $20. Couldn't, yeah. couldn't, get, rid them. couldn't yeah. get rid of them because nobody it, wanted the board game. It, <laughs> yeah, if Hasbro keeps doing it that way, then I'll be able to get the retro collection figures that I want because they're like the Snowspeeder Luke they're putting out in a board game re re relaunch or whatever. And it's like that's the only one I'm gonna want from that part of the retro line too. I don't need I don't need to rebuy vintage Empire figures that can't hold their weapons. I just want the the one they never made before. So if they do that again, I'm gonna be happy. But if they you know don't you know they they start putting them out on shelves, but not enough, then I'm going to be like, Arr. anyway. Yeah, but that's when I'm just going to solve the problem by saying, it's nothing money can't solve. <laughs> well, so. what, do you, what do you think about that? You know, that, that one figure that you want from the retro line and they pack it in with another board. They, they pack that in with the board game as well, aren't oh, they? Oh, it's horrible. Yeah, it's horrible. It's horrible. Yeah. They shouldn't be doing that. But if it keeps it on the shelf long enough that they stack up and I can get myself one or two of them, then I guess it was worth it in that regard. I don't want to be paying for the board game. I'm never going to play the board game. Uh, played <laughs> it back when I was a kid. It was lame. It was a spinner, you know, and a R2-D2, you know, whatever. Um, yeah. But but I, I'm glad I'll be able to get the figure at least. Assuming the figure isn't terrible. I'm not I'm not real sold yet on the Snowspeeder Luke with the big yellow visor over his eyes. I haven't quite. <laughs> but the Tarkin, I thought, turned out as well as one could expect. Uh, yeah. You know, given that it wasn't made by Kenner and Palatoy in 1978, so yeah. yeah. Do you do you have any board games in your collection? Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. Well, Linda always laughs at me because I have a lot of childhood board games, but I don't like playing board games anymore. So I, she's like, "Why do we have these?" And I'm like, "Cause I, I have Fireball Island. I don't want to get rid of it. I have Curse of the Idol. I don't want to get rid of it. Um, I played them a lot as a kid. Uh, I have." Master, uh, ma what's it called? Master Detective Edition Clue, you know the one yeah. that has the extra characters like Mrs. Peach and Colonel, Gr or not Colonel Mustard, but like General Gray and stuff like that. Um, I keep them around for the memories, but uh, I I've always meant to do videos about them, but I haven't. I need to get on that. <laughs> well, it's, um. A video that I really want to do, and I, I don't have it anymore, but I had the Hero Quest board game, and uh -huh. I've, I mentioned it in a video recently, and that was that was probably what I was into in that short couple of year hiatus between being a kid yep. playing with toys and becoming a collector. I got into Hero Quest and a little bit of Warhammer, not not a lot, but I was really into Hero right. Quest. Um, and I actually had a a guy message me on the Facebook page today and said. Um, uh, I must have mentioned it in another video. He saw it somewhere. So he sent me this message saying, um, if you can get the board game for a decent price and get all of the add-on packs, um, I would watch the video. And that was all he said. And I was like, oh, yeah, thanks. So I'm going to fork out a few hundred dollars for the board game and all the add-on packs because at least I know one person will watch the video. <laughs> well, that's like there's a guy right now that, that's, that's been uh, blowing up the, uh, the Retro Blasting inbox a uh, nice guy. Like, there's nothing wrong with the guy or yeah, anything. Yeah. He's a very, very nice guy. Um, he's not, like, yelling at me or anything like that. But he's really excited about the possibility, much like you with the Hero Quest thing. He wants me to review the Black Hole toy line. And I, I told him jokingly, I said, uh, but kind of seriously, I said, well, I said, I'm not ready to take out a second mortgage to buy a lot of the Black Hole figures. Um, I said, so if you've got a spare 30 grand lying around, I said, you know, maybe we can work something out or whatever. I was joking. And he turns around and he just starts sending me eBay link after eBay link. Well, th this set of figures isn't, you know, that expensive. And then I click on it and it's like $900 for the set. And I'm like, <laughs> that's kind of what I'm talking about. Like I was exaggerating, but, and he just kept throwing link after link at me. And I'm just like, I'm... I'm not in any position right now to buy all that stuff to do, you know, that video. I, I you know, I love the passion, but I'm like, uh, I, I literally can't pull the trigger on this at the moment. So, mm. yeah. All right. All right how, how many questions have we got left? One. We have oh, one. last one. Okay. Yeah, it's last one. If I didn't miscount, I think it's the last one. Okay. Um, 
I want to make this a good one, but I want to make it profound because I'm feeling a little bit pretentious. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, okay. Sum up in one word your the sum up in one word the relationship between your military experience and your action man action force enthusiasm. Inspiring. Inspiring. Was it chicken or the egg? Which one really kicked off the other? So I have a vague childhood memory of... Uh, it, it's, it's one of those childhood memories where I actually... I, I don't think I remember the real memory anymore, but I've told the story so many times throughout my life, I now remember telling the story. So, uh -huh. yep. uh, but I, 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 at one point in my life, I had a childhood memory <clears throat> of being in the back garden of my house in Goldsmith Road in Worthing in England and being shown an action man, basic soldier for the first time with the, the Black Beret and the SLR rifle and saying to my dad, what, what is this? I was like Indy holding up the idol, you know? <clears throat> and he's like, that's, that's a soldier. And, you know, uh -huh. well, what's a soldier? What do they do? And he's kind of explain, explaining this to me. And, and, and he, he remembers this better than I do. That's actually probably where the memories come from. I, I was, I think, too young uh -huh. to remember. Um, he said, and I just turned around, looked him straight in the eye, and he went, I'm going to be a soldier when I grow up. That wow. Plain and simple. And that's something that never left me. I, I always thought I would have a a long, like, 25-year career in the military. It didn't end uh -huh. up happening that, that way. But I certainly, you know, experienced everything I wanted to experience in, sure. in the military. I um, So I, I went into the Australian Army when I left high school. I did um, four, four years of, of general enlistment. I was a combat engineer. But at the time, in the mid-90s, there wasn't a lot going on in the world, and I got really bored. Um, mm -hmm. And when my four years was coming up, I opted to, to get out of the army, which I did. <clears throat> and I spent a couple of years in civilian life and then decided to move back to the UK in my early 20s. I was about 22, 23. And I arrived in the UK about two or three months before September 11. Wow. And then, and then literally a week later, enlisted in the, in the British Army. Nice. I'm, I'm actually surprised it took me a week to <laughs> to ponder this but yeah, yeah. so so yeah that, that that's where the inspiration really started and then obviously that time in the UK as well I think um I was too young to remember the Iranian embassy siege um mm -hmm. I would have been not even three like coming up right. to three years of age I would have been too young but I do remember the Falklands war being on TV mm -hmm. and um and that was in the, my prime sort of time, about five years of age. Action Man was pretty much everything to me then. And yeah, seeing the Falklands War sort of playing out on the on the nightly news, it was something like the only toy line I had that related to real life rather than a fantasy movie or whatever. So right, yeah, in, in, inspiring. Oh, I think the other probably expression is role models. Two words, isn't it? <laughs> well, we can we can combine it. I think it isn't. Does it sometimes have a hyphen? Let's say it has a hyphen and it's a code <laughs> name. This is this is Action Force code name role model. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I always found Action Man to be a role model, and which is really weird because there was not a storyline linked to it. It was just a product. I yeah. think it's to do with the way that uh the way the art was drawn for the boxes the way the the figures looked and i mean even having german soldiers in in the line yeah. and stickers appearing on some of the product it was i think although well, action man covered a lot of stuff it was still very world war ii grounded as well yes. and the way us kids i think in those times looked at everyone's my generation, everyone's grandparent, everyone's grandfather pretty much served. Uh, right. my, 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 my dad's dad was um, a medic in Burma. He treated a lot of the prisoners of war who came off the Burma railway. And 
my my mum's dad, my granddad on my, on my mother's side, I always knew he was in the Navy. He was one of those guys, like a lot of them, never talked about his wartime experiences. And it was many, many, I think it was the... 60th anniversary of D-Day. I was living in the UK at the time and I used to go around and see my grandmother once a week on a Thursday. I think I would go around there after work and have, have dinner with her. Uh, and my granddad had long since passed away. But when it was coming up to the 60th anniversary of D-Day, I had his old medals in a shoe box that I'd been basically given when he passed away. And I said, look, I don't want these in a shoe box anymore. I want to celebrate these. I want to get them framed. And my grandmother pulled out some um some old world war ii photos of my grandfather in his naval uniform and actually it turned out that a year or two after the war ended the the royal navy was uh, developing a new drill manual so showing mm -hmm. a and my grandfather was the model that they picked for the so we had some amazing photos of him showing like this is how to correctly stand because he was quite a tall muscular man you know? yeah this standard ease this is how to stand at attention here's how to do the present arms so i picked my two favorite of these photos put them into a frame yeah. with, with the medals overlaid behind a map of um the d-day landing beach or sword beach specifically mm -hmm. yeah um, and she had all of his demob papers his service record she put me in touch with a guy that he used to serve with and i, I didn't know much about i, I think being a real army focused military guy um i you know a lot of the navy guys were, were on the ships for months at a time and it turns out that my grandfather was part of the 702nd assault flotilla um which dropped troops on the beach on d-day right. wow not only that he was a semaphore flagman a signalman and um, so they had all these landing craft landing on Sword Beach. Well, I think in each assault flotilla, they would have two of them would be what they called smoke layers. So rather than having troops on them, they'd have these 44-gallon drums of some kind of liquid. And basically, before the troops would land on the beach, the smoke layers would come right up to the beach and then drive along the beach, laying all the smoke to cover the, mm -hmm. the advance. Uh, and it turned out that although the, the Germans didn't know what was going on at the time, they're laying all this smoke... And then, then all the beach landing guys came in because the the beach landing, the guys driving the, the landing craft, because they came under enemy fire first, they got some other medal for it. And my granddad was always annoyed going, I was the first one there, but because they didn't shoot at us because they didn't know what we were doing. Right. Uh, but it, it, yeah, and it was, it, I found it a real shame. It was like 15 years after he'd passed away. I had no idea he was even involved in D-Day and he was at wow. the beach landings at Sword Beach. So... Yeah. Dang, man. That's Big awesome. Grandfather. Yeah. 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 And, that, and then that, that frame that I got made, um, basically I wrote up like a, an A4 page, which I put on like a nice parchment paper and basically kind of wrote his history of what he did in, in the war. Then I got to put into this big frame for the 60th anniversary. And then that Christmas, I couldn't think of what to give my grandmother for Christmas. So I gave her that frame and it hangs on the wall in her house. Um, that's awesome. Yeah. That's yeah, cool. She's, yeah, she's been a widow for a long time, but it's, uh, I think it's just nice that she's got this yeah. thing of granddad there. And uh, yeah. I remember uh, we, I've been to Normandy uh, twice and uh, both times I made sure that I went to all the beaches, all of them. Like it wasn't just the rah, rah American trip. It was, you know, sword, gold, Juno, you know, yeah. I've read about all that stuff. And uh it was so funny because uh, there was a, a British uh, tour guide with us on the second trip. The second trip was a class trip. I was still in the UK at the time. This was 93. And uh, this uh, this British guy, I guess he was, he had been, fr yeah, he was, there were still a lot of veterans living then in 93. And he was friends with a lot of them and he was relating stories. And one of the guys had said when they came up, I can't remember if this was Gold Beach or Sword. It was one of the two. I can't remember which one we were at, uh, but it was one of the two British beaches. And um, he related this story about how the landing craft opened up and the troops started to come. They came running out onto the beach. And even though the Germans were waking up and, you know, starting their, you know, defense or whatever. And he talked about the smoke going off and everything like that. They said there was a French, like a... Um, 
French woman. He didn't indicate her age, but he didn't indicate she was very old. And she was just thrilled. And she was on the low beach wall that separated the street from the, the sand. And she was kicking her legs up as high as she could, thrilled, dancing as a, in celebration with no knickers on at all. And <laughs> all, the, all, the, all the soldiers were just like, like, like they're trying to stay alive. And at the same time, there's this civilian do, you know, they were like, it was a very weird, the guy, I remember him saying, he said, the, the, the dude said, it was a very strange experience, you know, knowing that the war had started up again for me. And here I am running onto this beach and I'm hearing gunfire and shell fire and I'm trying to remember my training. And all we're staring at is this woman dancing on the seawall with no knickers on. And... <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. It, it, it is, there are so many, what I call like wartime memories of mine that are just bizarre. Um, yeah. and we've, we've been going for an hour and a half. So we'll probably wrap up the, oh, the podcast sorry, sorry, minute, sorry. but uh, no, no, yeah. no, it's all good. But I, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna share this, this story. So the first time, uh, when I started to do private security work in, in Iraq, I, um, I was based outside of the U S embassy, not the new embassy that they built, but it was Saddam's old presidential palace, uh -huh. which is actually very well featured in the movie green zone with Matt Damon, not uh -huh. a brilliant film, but everything right. looks correct. You know, gotcha. um, someone who's haven't, haven't been there. It looks spot on, but going into the U S embassy for the first, it takes ages to get in there. All the security you have to go through, but the presidential palace had a large Olympic size swimming pool out, out the back. Um, and then the main palace was the embassy. All the accommodation was like demountable buildings out the back covered in sandbags. And I remember going down to the swimming pool at the presidential palace the first day I was there. And I'm, I walk in and uh, there's not many British people there. You know, there's, it's ma ma mainly Americans. And I walk in and everybody's armed. And there, there are guys in like board shorts putting tanning oil on them on sunbeds with an M16 next to them. Then there are soldiers <laughs> walking around and I look up and it was in the, I remember it was in the evening because I remember looking up and a, a Black Hawk flew overhead and fired a bit of chafe and it's, I'm like, oh, it's almost like I'm in apocalypse now. And then this music starts, this, mu this country and Western music starts and I turn around and there's a DJ and there's all these Americans on a dance floor um, and they're like off duty guys and right. they, they've still got, M16 slung and Beretta's in holsters and they're having the line the, the, the weekly line dancing competition and I'm just like what on what? <laughs> I have entered the twilight zone they're black right. hawks and sandbags and, and a line dancing competition which they held every Friday night wow <laughs> DJ and everything, and and everyone's got the hats and. <laughs> See that just confirms, and I'll, I'll I'll say this very quick, and then I'll let you do your thing. But uh, have you seen the movie The Big Red One with Lee Marvin? Yes, not not recently, but yeah, I okay. I, 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 I certainly yeah. Was it the director's cut or was it just the theatrical version? I believe just the theatrical version. Oh, okay, okay, the theatrical version was taken. It was the movie was taken away from him from Samuel Fuller. It was butchered up and cut to 90 minutes because the producers were idiots. Because Samuel Fuller was a war veteran in the in the yes, first Army yeah. division. Yeah. And he wanted to make this the seminal uh GI experience in Europe in World War II. Like he wanted to tell the story of what it was like to be in World War II in the liberation of Europe, like from the American dog faces perspective. Like yeah. and so he made this amazingly broad movie, like as far as like all the different experiences just like that in the sense that he said war is weird war is not just you know da -da 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 all the time and all this he said war is a series of the most surreal moments you'll ever see just juxtaposed next to the scariest moments you'll ever have in your life and so he made a movie like this that was like three and a half hours long that was, you know, Mark Hamill's in it and Lee Marvin and all these guys. And they're all in the first division, you know, first they North Africa, then Italy, then then Omaha Beach. I mean, it was and 
when you see the movie, oh, I they they released it on DVD. Uh, they found all the footage, reconstructed it, re-released it on on DVD about 15 years ago, and it still hasn't been put out on Blu-ray, which is like. Argh. But anyway, when you watch it, you realize what a lost masterpiece it is, and when you hear stories like yours, you realize how authentic it is. But you also understand an ignorant producer that had never been in a in combat before would probably have cut all that stuff out thinking that it was weird, artsy-fartsy stuff, mm. and it's not. It's literal, this is the way this works, and it is as strange as it looks. And when I saw the film in that uncut version, I was like, wow, this is, this is better than Private Ryan in terms of capturing what war is really like. Like, Omaha Beach and Private Ryan is, is untouchable as a demo reel. Like, if you want to show what, what that combat as scenario a, as a single scene as a single scene but the rest of the movie is pretentious poetry like it is just the most pretentious just it's like oh my god really big red one director's reconstruction even though he was dead so it's called the reconstruction you gotta see it you've got to i mean it is so it's just like wow like Every weird story a veteran has ever told me is all true. Like it's all true. Yeah. So anyway. I'm I'm going straight online after this to try and to try and get that. Yeah. Copy. Yeah. If you have trouble finding it, let me know. I have a DVD. I might be able to rip it and then send it to you. Yeah. So yeah. Cool. All right. Well, that's a pretty good place to uh, to end the podcast for today. I think. Um, yeah. Thanks ever so much for taking some time out of your schedule again to to sit down. It's been. It's been fun as always. Yeah, absolutely. I quite, love doing these. I've had quite a good laugh actually. It's uh, we, <laughs> we 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 need that at these times. So we do, we do. It, yeah, it's a good break. Yeah. So yeah, thank you all for watching, and I'm going to end with one word: nobly. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Bye bye.